hotel room last night, so I typed up like some talking points because I figure as soon as I'm just on a stage and have to say something that I thought about before seeing the crowd, <laughs> that I would forget it as soon as I saw the crowd. Um, man, like this brings me back to high school. I, I'd volunteered to go first to present some sort of script or like, like line from a book, and then as soon as I get on the stage, I'm like, and uh, it was just terrible. Um, and then when I ran for class president in high school and I totally lost, I was like wearing this zebra striped getup with like some pink accents and then ended up singing Fly Me to the Moon. So <laughs> all to avoid giving an actual speech, say. Okay, so isn't this kind of amazing? I mean, I, everybody said how amazing, how big the crowd is and then there's this other room with the telecast so there's like twice this. Um, but imagine if our classes were like this with like the representation of women in it. And I think that that's something um, that you don't get to really experience often, especially in, in STEM. Like, you're, you're lucky if it's anywhere near 50-50. So just seeing us all together and knowing that we've been through those experiences is just so great. And uh, man, it's never been a better time to be a woman in tech, but we know that we're making it better. Um, and I think events like this are like some of the steps towards that. So I can't wait for our daughters and our nieces to like, make their career choice completely independent of some outdated stereotype. Uh, I guess I wanted to impart the three wishes that I had for each of us. So first is that we don't succumb to the people who want to make us doubt ourselves. So we know that there are people online and maybe people in classes, depending on where you go to school, um, that are haters. <laughs> And I think it's uh, just best to be able to realize that that's irrelevant to what you're going to do, because you know what you want to do and, and you're gonna do that. Um, second would be that we can resist pressure from the people who wanna plan our future for us. And the thing with that is that I feel like a lot of times people in your life are very much there for you and they support you, but they might have some vision for what you are going to do that doesn't align with yours. So it's hard sometimes to really separate that out and make sure that you are doing what you want to do. And I guess the third wish that I would have for us is that you know we're all in technical fields and that means that we've spent years learning just the groundwork to then do our jobs. And that's kind of scary if you think about the fact that like what if your interests change or what if you realize you wanna do something else. Um, so I hope that we're not afraid to um, of the lost time and like the, the idea that we've lost this time doing one thing or learning one thing if we end up deciding to change course because I think it's important to just be able to go with what you feel like is the right thing to do and not be afraid of, of maybe what you've been prepared for in the past. Okay, so now to the storytelling, I guess. Who here was a weird kid? Yeah, yeah. It's cool now. I think it's cool now. <laughs> I thought it was cool when I was a kid. <laughs> um, but, okay, so I'm trying to, like, so I guess the big thing I want to convey is somehow, like, surrounding yourself with talented people helps you so much. And so this is where being together like this and hopefully talking to each other more than you listen to people like me on stage is, is important because, like, just even when I, like, first started elementary school, I was in kindergarten, and every morning they'd have snack time. And there were these cups with jokes on them. And Allison knew how to read much better than anybody else in the class. So whenever everybody got those joke cups, they would run over to Allison and ask her to read them out loud. And I was like, why can't I be like Allison? So we went to the grocery store, my parents and I, and we bought like all of the same cups with riddles on them so that I could learn the words on those and then be the same person. Now, I didn't necessarily get the other kids to come and ask me to read it because there's a people skill element that, I, <laughs> that was not quite developed at, in kindergarten. But the same thing, Matt knew his multiplication tables and soon enough I learned my multiplication tables. And it's just fun to be around people that have skills that you want to have. I thought it was fun in high school, the first math class I took that was advanced, I was with a bunch of other students, some of them had failed the course last year, and we were teaching each other this stuff. And I think that if there's one thing maybe that can be improved upon is the way that we tend to grade students and try to like separate out, oh, you're gonna be good at this one thing or whatnot. But really, I think giving some sort of 
power to the people who maybe have, might not have done well in something and having them teach people who know less about that than them makes them feel like they have some sort of command over the subject. Learning from mistakes. So I was the type of person who would just always obsess over exams. I did well in school. I get like good grades because I cared about grades. And in hindsight, you know, grades don't really matter. It's what you're doing. It's what you're interested in that matters. But it is interesting to find the fact that you can just obsess over something or care about something and use that to motivate you. So I knew that I would over obsess about some things and sometimes that's a flaw, but sometimes you can use that to really harness your like focus on something. Um, and, and the final weird kid situation, I remember I tried to be really clever with this uh, application um, for my uh, PhD funding. So, you have an interview round where you're supposed to go in and answer some questions and hopefully you get to the next round and your PhD is gonna be paid for. Now, what happened was I knew the room where this interview was gonna be, so I was like, okay, I'm gonna go in in the middle of the night to the MIT Media Lab and write on the board stuff from a paper that I had just written, thinking that, oh, when I come back in the morning, they're going to, uh, like see this and then it'll be a funny joke, right? I'll be like so prepared. So on the one hand, it kind of worked. I came in in the morning, had my interview, the first one in the morning, and their quiz was to explain what was on the board. And I was like, ha ha, I wrote that on the board. So I felt pretty good about myself at that moment. Then the end of my interview session came and I went to try to erase said board. And I realized that I had written in permanent marker on that board. So immediately my like, pride in the fact that I got them turned into this ultimate shame. There was a Harvard-Yale football game that, um, that uh, afternoon and the whole time I'm just running through my head exactly what had happened and how I grabbed the Sharpie and why they had a Sharpie in a room with a whiteboard wall. Um, <laughs> And then I came back in the evening and had like alcohol, like just tons of isopropyl to clean off this board. And it worked, it reached, but it, 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 everything was clean, so no, no damage to property. But it's just, I think it's funny because I was so embarrassed and yet tried to do something to show that I was like on top of things and it utterly did not work. But I ended up getting the fellowship and everything, so it worked out in, in the big scheme of things, but it's just, those little things in life where you feel so embarrassed that you just keep thinking about it and then like, you think that's the only thing that matters and you realize that <laughs> it's such a small story. Um, okay, so I think that if anything, I would hope that everybody here can hold on to their naivety as long as possible because you can do a lot more um, than you're aware that you can when you're unaware of what you can't do. When, what draws us into our technical fields is not necessarily what will keep us in those fields. So the one thing too that I would, I guess, take away from that type of experience is that I hope that we all stay as long as possible in the sweet spot where we're willing to ask for help. Collecting mentors uh, is something that's valuable because you don't just want to have one voice that isn't your own guiding you. So. Those are my two or three cents, and I really can't wait to see what we all do, because right, there's how many of us here? Like, like five something thousand? Uh, you know that in a couple of years we're gonna be doing great things. Some of them, like statistically, we have to be doing something great. So it would be really fun to see what that is and keep track of that, so.